Well, welcome. It is, uh, it's good to be here. It feels like a lot happened this week, doesn't it? All it did was snow a whole bunch, but it sure feels like a lot happened. Uh, <laughs> that was a big deal. Whew. Um, this is, I don't know, I, I grew up in Delta. This is almost as long as I've ever seen snow stick around. Right? I mean, this is, a, whew, this is amazing. Um, last few weeks, we have been in this series called Get Wisdom, and, and we've been opening up the book of Proverbs and, and looking at what it has for us in terms of being wise people, making wise choices, and pursuing wisdom, and, and the wisdom of God that is bound up in Christ as we pursue Christ. It's the same, to pursue Christ is to pursue wisdom. Uh, because he is, the, he is the source, the fountainhead of all things wise, of, of all wisdom. And, and, um, and we, are, we are called as, as his disciples to grow in wisdom. And this is, a, this is an area of um, practicality. I mean, this is, it's about how you, wisdom is not about what you think about. It's about how you act. It's about how you walk. It's about what you do. And so a couple, a few weeks ago, we talked about uh, what does it look like to walk with the wise? And, and uh, last week we talked about uh, walking and being heart wise and, and being wise in our relationships and the profound impact that that has on our life. And, and uh, this week we're talking about money, one of the most spiritual topics you could pick and talk about in church, All right? As a matter of fact, it's kind of funny we, when we talk, when we think about money. You know, we go to you go to church. If this is your if your first Sunday, you might have said you might have been like, um, I don't know what they're going to talk about today, but I don't. Uh, but I hope they don't talk about money. <laughs> we just kind of feel like that's a not a very spiritual topic, and the reason we think that is because we draw lines of distinction between things that are physical, real world realities and things that are spiritual. We kind of divorce them from one another. We kind of, you know, we, there's, there's your, you have your spiritual life and you have the rest of your life, right? Every, all the other stuff you do. And the fact of the matter is, Jesus did not play that game at all. Our spiritual life is our real life. Everything about this world, everything about you is spiritual. You're a spiritual being, and everything that happens in your life happens in a spiritual category. And when we, when we take those apart, we actually are going to miss a lot of what God has for us. Um, talking about money, you know, is, is not focusing on things that are not spiritual. It's actually, um, what, we're ta- what we're really saying when we say that is, can we talk about something that I'm more comfortable with? That's, that's probably more the, uh, <laughs> um, what we're really getting at, uh, because finances are such a, a personal, intimate part of our life. Every single one of us uh, wrestles with those things. Every single one of us deals with the realities of um, uh, the, the ramifications of, of money. It has a huge impact on our life, and this is why Jesus talks about it so much. It's amazing if you actually ever read through the, the Gospels and with a checklist and just, you know, or with a, you know, I've seen some people do this uh, uh, really well, some, some artistic types uh, go through and like as they read their Bible will highlight passages in sort of a colored coded way and just go through and, and like maybe with a green colored pencil just kind of like underline or, or make a mark every time Jesus talks about money. You'll be amazed at how, how many green marks you're going to find in your Bible. Jesus is always talking about money. Uh, a large, large portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We said this is one of the most uh, important sermons Jesus ever preached. And a, a large amount of that deals w- with one way or another with money. It's a, big, it's a big deal in our life. Money is spiritual. It is very spiritual. It's one of the few things in life um, that can easily and quickly become the overwhelming focus of our life and our devotion and hide in our lives as an idol that our heart belongs to. And, and, um, and this process happens so quickly and we, we can not even notice it happening. It's amazing. 
We, we, but we still tend to see money not as a, a spiritual issue until, <laughs> until we get in financial trouble, right? And then, and then it becomes a huge spiritual issue in our life. God, I am broke, right? I need your help. I need you to do a financial a miracle in my life. You know, it gets real spiritual when, when the pain, or our, you know, the financial pain gets real. We make it a spiritual issue and we pray to God, help us. The truth is, in, this, in life, money will either master you or you will master your money. And, uh, and to master your money, you need to gain wisdom and become money wise. Here's, listen, <clears throat> Money management is a skill to develop. Managing your money is a skill to develop. It's not, no one is born with it, right? No one is born knowing how to manage their money well. It is something we all have to learn. And, um, but this is, this is the good news. There are some things, there are some things I'm just bad at just because, because of who I am. I, they're just, uh, so there are some people that just have natural talents, natural abilities, um, things that are, I'm just, I am not, um, I'm not very good at art. And I know that I could probably develop that a little bit, but there are some people that just have that that eye, right? That artistic eye. You know what I'm talking about um, when you uh, when when you see it. We've got a lot of we've got a lot of really amazing artists in this room, to tell you the truth. And um, and it's it's such a it's isn't it such a pleasure? I mean, when you go and you just look at a piece of art that that uh, causes a, that response inside of you, and you're like, oh wow, this is this is amazing. And and I've I've painted some things before. And I've drawn some things before, but um, no one ever had an emotional experience looking at them, at least not a positive one, you know? There might have been a tear shed, but it wasn't one of those, you know what I mean? <laughs> so we all have things that we're, but listen, there's, there's a lot of things in life that nobody is born with, and, and the, the best news of all is this is just simply a skill. Anyone can learn to, to, to manage and master finances. It's, it's, it's one of those things that you can learn, no, no matter where you are in all of this, no matter if you're just you know, sitting here today in great shape, or maybe, I'm, and I'm guessing there might be some people here that are just feeling like they are at least up to their neck. I mean, just when it comes to finance, finances, they, you just feel like you're buried. It is a source of stress and anxiety and fear and all of those things, and, and um, that, that, can be, that can be horrifying. But even, listen, I'm telling you, Number one, I have been there, and, and number two, it is literally just a matter of developing a, uh, of embracing a few principles and developing a few habits that could absolutely and radically change your life in this area. And all of these things are found in the scriptures. Money management is a skill to develop. So important to understand. Don't let it ever become more than that in your mind because that will, that will just result in fear. This is, this, is how, this is one way God just tames that fear in our life. This is manageable. But you also need to know this, that materialism is an idol to be destroyed. God does not tolerate idols. He doesn't tolerate them. We look through the, the Old Testament, and, and there's, there's like this, um, uh, the, the, the children of Israel will be in a, a season where they're just in love with God, and they're pursuing God, and then, and then uh, a generation will rise up that didn't know God. I mean, they, just, they don't know who he is, and they pursue other things, and all of a sudden, there's just idols surrounding them all over the place, and, and God raises up a judge or a king or a prophet or whatever. I mean, throughout the history of Israel, he raises somebody up and they come against those things. They come against those idols. And um, they, don't, they don't just simply teach about why the idols are, are you know, negative influences in the culture. They don't, um, they don't say, 
um, you know, let's put all the idols in, in one spot and it'll just become a tourist attraction. They don't, um, they don't manage, bring a management plan to idolatry. They burn them. They chop them up. They destroy them. Every time an enemy of God arises, he calls the people of the light to lop their heads off. And when it comes to this issue, that's what we need to be committed to in our life. We don't manage materialism. Materialism is an idol to be destroyed in our lives. You'll never get to a point in your life where you are money-wise at a biblical standard if you don't first deal with the issue of materialism. God understands this. And this is why, I mean, my, my whole life um, in, in ministry, um, I've talked to lots and lots of people over the last 25 years and, and uh, about money. You know, we, we have this conversation, right? We have this ongoing conversation. And so many people have, uh, that, that, I've, that I've conversed with about the church and about ministry, about baptism, about, um, uh, you, I mean, you name it, about discipleship, about what it means to follow Jesus in, in any way, shape, or form. And, and sometimes, sometimes believers, sometimes non-believers, inside of this conversation, inevitably, somebody brings something up like this. God just really, all, it seems like the only thing God wants is my money. Which, if you take a second and think about, that is one of the silliest conclusions that we could possibly come to when it, when it comes to stuff like this. But at church, we talk about money. You know, we take an offering and we, you know, we're, we're, we're talk, we talk about budgets and we got, we got all these things, you know. Just sometimes it can feel that way. That all God really wants is your money. Um, we, don't, we don't sit around and, um, like, Maybe we should, but we don't sit around and talk about, uh, you know, what the theme of the day is and, and all of this, but um, it's kind of amazing. Today, um, both Dunn and Ken um, brought this up, I mean, the, the prophet Isaiah talking about all of these things that he had commanded the people of Israel to do these things, right? Bring in your tithe, and the tithe was, uh, was part, part of, was, was um, yeah, it could, be, it could be money, but it could also be animals for sacrifice and, and all of those things. He says, I, you know, I, I get tired of all of this, and, and, you know, we think about, God even says through, through one of the prophets, he says, if I, if I ever got hungry, which is, it's a, you know, this is an odd thing to think about. He's saying, I'm God, I don't get hungry. But if I ever got hungry, do you actually think that I would come to you for some food? I, you know, say, I created everything by willing it into existence. I created everything. I spoke it all into everything that is. The food that you eat, I made. If I got hungry, do you think I'd be coming to you for food? Do you think I want your stuff? Now, here, there was a practical reason for all of these sacrifices. The tr there, was, uh, there were uh, 12 tribes. It depends how you count, because one tribe was actually kind of a, a two half tribes. It was kind of this weird thing. Joseph was Ephraim and Manasseh. So sometimes when they count all the tribes in, in, the, New, in the Old Testament, there's always 12. Sometimes the Levites get left out, and that's because they never went to war. So that, so that there would always be 12 tribes. Um, they, would, they had this half tribe that split in two to be two names, so there were 12 names in this list. And sometimes there weren't. Sometimes the Levites were included, and there were only 12 tribes. It's a, a little bit confusing. But the Levites didn't get any land. When, when they came into the promised land and divided it all up, the Levites didn't get any land. They got, there were some cities set aside throughout um, all of Israel where the Levites lived. 
but the tribe of Levites um, didn't inherit land. Instead, God told them, I am your inheritance. It was this fascinating thing. And because of this, God raised up this tribe of Levites as a, a tribe of priests that would serve before him throughout the, um, uh, throughout the nation. And they would serve in Jerusalem at the, at the temple, and, and they would be in charge of all the sacrifices and all the processes and all this. And when you would bring your sacrifice, if you go back, you can read this in, in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, when you go back and brought, when you brought your sacrifice to the temple... Um, some, a a small portion of your sacrifice was put on the altar and just burned to ash, gone forever. The rest of it was cooked and eaten by the Levites and their families. That's how how they were fed. If you brought grain, it went to the Levites. So all the other tribes, through their offerings to God, were actually supporting the Levites in their work. And part of their work was to teach the word of God to all the people. And what would happen over time is that people would, um, would stop. They'd stop coming and they'd stop giving to the Lord. And, and um, the Levites would get hungry. And they would stop doing their job. And instead, they'd go out and they'd farm and they'd ranch and they'd raise food for their families. And no one was taking care of the ministry. And then all the, you know, things would, would not go very well and things would start falling apart and, and, um, and the people would recognize what was going on. They, they would recognize the problems. They would repent and they would, they would bring their tithe back to the temple. When God says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there might be food in my house in Malachi, the food is for the Levites. So that now the Levites are back to work. Somebody's actually teaching the word of God. People are learning how to follow the Lord and, and, and put him first in their life. And things would go a lot better for a while. None of this stuff was actually for God. He wasn't, he wasn't living off of any of it. Even in the Old Testament, people understood that a house or a temple that was beautiful, full of gold, just an amazing structure, could not contain God. God doesn't actually, you know, live there. You, you can't build a house in this creation that is big enough to contain God. They understood that. But it was a place for them, an anchored place in reality for them to come and minister before God to sacrifice and to give, and and God commands them to do this. And so our question really ought to be, if God doesn't need money, if God doesn't need food, if God doesn't need a house, why why does he command us, why does he call us to give, to sacrifice? And the reality is it has nothing to do with anything that God actually needs. It has everything to do with what you need. And what you need is freedom from materialism. What you need is to slay the idol of materialism in your life that can so easily get a grip on your heart, a death grip on your heart, and choke out every bit of spiritual life in you. And the best way to lop off the, idol, the heads of the enemies of God, the idol of materialism in your life, is to give to God what he's asked you to give. In, in, our, um, you know, in our Western wisdom, when it, comes to, when it comes to stuff like this, we have a hard time adding all of this up because oftentimes we just don't think in terms of these types of spiritual realities. But... Um, 
But all throughout Scripture, we're called to give generously to God. And it is not, it, it is not to make God rich. You can't do that. He already owns everything. It is also not to make the pastor rich. Scripture warns against, um, against this kind of desire in our life. And, and, and we have, listen, there are a lot of uh, examples in our culture of people who have used ministry and used the word of God to become exceedingly wealthy. And um, I don't need to say anything about that because the scripture stands against it. Anyone who would think that the gospel of Jesus Christ is an opportunity for wealth does not understand the scriptures and does not understand the word of God. There is a movement in our culture that is spreading all over the world that, that will preach to you that God's will for your life is that you just have everything that you want. That you just have all the money you can handle, that you just, you never get sick. Whatever you want in life, all you have to do is imagine it and demand it from God. And let me tell you something if God was trying to raise up a kingdom full of entitled, ruined human beings, that is exactly what he would have said. And let me tell you what, if that is his purpose, then the Father owes Jesus an apology. Because Jesus didn't have any of those things. God owns all of the apostles a huge apology because they never made any money. They dealt with sickness. They were they're oftentimes very poor. They understood what it was to, to want and to have to trust God every moment of every day for the things that they needed. I don't know, I don't know how the apostles got it so wrong. Of course, I'm being facetious. I hope you understand that. That is, that is not, and if you want to hear a message, if you, want to, if you want to hear a message that that's what God wants for you, he just wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and you know, all, all that stuff, you're not going to hear it here. Because that is not the message of the scripture. That is not God's will for you and for your heart that is not what uh, is going to build your character to become more like Christ. None of those things will be true, and you will never hear it in this place. What God wants, what God really wants for us is to become like Jesus. And if we're going to become like Jesus, we're going to have to walk through circumstances and situations like Jesus walked through. We're going to have to understand that to, to, to be like that, to have the character of Christ, we need to learn to put him first above all things, even our own comfort, even our own desires. Yes, that means that, means that we need to learn to sacrifice so that this idol of materialism can be struck down in our life. The best way to do that is to learn to give generously to God. That's number one today. Learn to give generously to God. Proverbs 11, 25, 24 and 25 says, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and the one who waters will himself be watered. This seems like, um, I mean, in one sense, this seems a little backwards, right? It seems a little bit backwards and inside out. He's saying the, the person who shares with other people is blessed somehow. And the one who holds everything back and never shares still suffers want. We live in a culture that idolizes riches, if you are rich, you are so, uh, I mean, you are, you're great. You're, you must be smarter than everybody else. Solomon, who was the smartest man who ever lived, he wrote, the, he wrote much of the book of Proverbs. He also wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. Whew, that's, a, that's a fun one. 
Uh, lots of wisdom in there, but it's kind of, it's brutal. Uh, he, <laughs> um, he, says, uh, he says in this book that he, he's like, he says, sometimes, I mean, this is, it's so meaningless. It's so weird. It's so backward. It would make so much more sense for us if all of the really wise people were rich and all of the really foolish people were poor. But he says, look around. Sometimes the, the most foolish people you'll ever see are the richest people you know. And the wise people don't have anything. When we begin to draw these lines, we fall in a trap into a lie. God does not qualify his disciples by their bank accounts. God doesn't work that way. There's rich and there's wealthy. And some of the richest people I know don't have a lot of money. And some of the wealthiest people I know are some of the most miserable people I know, which is why the word miser and the word miserable come from the same place. God wants you, yeah, (laughs) let me qualify this really quick. I believe God wants you to be rich, but that that might not mean you're wealthy. God wants to pour blessing into your life, but that might not mean you get everything your flesh wants. There's a huge difference. And we learn to understand this difference. We learn to understand this divine economy when we choose to be generous toward God. There there are two ways to look at this world, and and, uh, I am amazed at the difference in how our mindset, uh, this change of our mindset, affects everything about our life. There's this, uh, what's one, uh, one mindset, which is called a scarcity mentality or a scarcity mindset. And it's the mindset that we, you know, we wring our hands. We're like, there's never enough to go around. And that means I've got to get out there and I've got to get everything that's mine. When we don't have enough. Sometimes I've, I've heard of people who, um, uh, you know, children who've, who've grown up in, uh, in places where they just, there just wasn't. They just didn't have. Maybe they didn't have food, the, the, uh, as much food as they needed or, or uh, maybe a bed to sleep in or someone to take care of them like children should have. And I've, and I've, you know, I've uh, spoken with parents who have adopted and, and gone through the struggles of, of watching children who, who life just taught them to have that scarcity mentality. And every time there was food, they would take it and they would hoard it and squirrel it away because they were so afraid that there wouldn't be something later. Jesus is constantly talking about this, this thing he calls the abundant life. And sometimes we hear that and we think, ah, see, there it is. Jesus wants me to be rich. And the fact of the matter is that has very little to do with the abundant life that Jesus is talking about if you really stop and listen to what he's saying. I think he's calling us to a different mentality. To to see the world differently. Because... Um, really what's, what's happening is, is he is calling us to um, this place to, to answer this question. Who is your provider? Who's your provider anyway? Is it you? If it's you, then really all you have is to scratch out whatever you can. Yep, get, I don't know why you're here. You're wasting time. You need to get out there and get what's yours if you're your provider. But if God is your provider, oh, wait a second. This is, this is totally different. Remember when Jesus was, was with these crowds and, and for three days they were out in the wilderness and Jesus was teaching and, and, and you know, sharing and healing and doing all this stuff and people just did not want to go. And they'd heard that he had done some miracles and they were maybe, maybe they were hoping and waiting that he'd do this thing again where he fed all those people. And um, if, you, if you look in the scriptures, there's the feeding of the 5,000 and then a little while later the feeding of the 4,000. And I always thought that was crazy. 
wouldn't you think it would be the feeding of the 5,000 and then the feeding of the 25,000? Right? Because everyone heard about that. It's like, hey, no, he's going to do it again, you guys. This is what he does. Don't go. The first one, the feeding of the 5,000, he was out there for the day. They, all these people were listening to him. They didn't expect anything, and he fed them all. Lots and lots of people. The second one, he's out there for three days in the wilderness. And my guess is, after day one was over, everybody was like, eh, guess it's not going to happen. Let's head back to town. And then day two comes, and everybody's like, yeah, I'm pr pretty hungry. We've pretty much gone through most of our supply, but let's just get out there, and let's, let's see what happens. You know, he's saying some amazing things, and, and I mean, it's Jesus after all, and day two goes by, and a few people were like, oh, okay, I don't think it's going to happen. Let's, let's head back to town. Day three. At the end of the day, at the end of day three, Jesus turns to his disciples, and he says, these people are hungry. Give them something to eat. And they could hardly find anything. They were completely impoverished of food. They didn't have anything except for, you know, just, just some scraps. What we would call, especially for the problem at hand, just some scraps. And Jesus took what little they had and fed everyone with it. Who is your provider? It has everything to do, the answer to that question is everything to do with how you're going to respond in this area of your life. I think we ought to actually get pretty good at, um, at doing that. I don't, know if, I don't know how you go about paying your bills. That could be, sometimes that could be a pretty stressful thing. I don't know. Do you, do you open them up like every time they come? Do you just open it right away? And, uh, so, you know, some people do that. want to know what it is. Open it right away. Cringe a little bit. Mm. Man, um, yeah, it got really cold this month, and it shows, right? That's, we look at that, oh, okay, and we put that in the drawer or whatever, you put them away, or maybe you just like don't even, don't even bother opening that bill. Let's leave all of the sorrow and suffering until the day we pay the bill. So just leave them closed, put them on the shelf, we'll get to that, and we'll just do it all at once. It doesn't really matter how you do it. But I think when we do it, I think what we ought to do is just maybe before you open that envelope or before you sit down to pay those bills and worry about all the money stuff, just ask yourself that question. Who's your provider anyway? Who is it really? Whose arms are you leaning on? When we... When we choose to give generously to God, we practice the answer to that question. And I'm telling you, there is nothing that will slay the idol of materialism faster or more effectively in your life than being generous with God. Number two, work for God, not for money. The rest of these are a little bit easier because now we've, you know, we've built a good foundation, right? Work for God, not for money. Again, it's a security issue. Oftentimes what we do is we go to work and we're working for money. And, and listen, that is, going to, that is going to result in misery. Here's why. Because um, all throughout the scriptures, when the people practiced idolatry, the warning that came against them is that if you practice this idolatry, you become like the gods you serve. You become like them. And if you are working for money, I mean, there's kind of a double meaning to that, and I hope you're hearing it. If you're working for money, money's your boss. You're working for it. And um, you will become more like it. And if we were just to think and, you know, just sort of personify for a moment, like, what does this idol of materialism look like? I mean, what is the idol of money. What does it really look like? What does it act like? We even we we have it. We already have all of these things. We talk about cold, hard cash. And if you work for money, you are slowly becoming cold and hard. Money's elusive. We, I mean, we can just go on and on. I mean, this is what happens when you serve an idol. You become like that idol, which is why God says no. 
you need to worship the Lord your God and serve him only because you need to become more like him. There's nothing else in all of the universe that is better than becoming like Jesus. So work for God, not for money. Proverbs 23, 4 says this, do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When it uses that word toil, it means don't kill yourself. It's that kind of work. Work is good. Work is not a, uh, you know, it's not a dirty word. It's not one of those four-letter words. Um, sometimes we think of it that way. I'm going to go to work, you know, whatever. God works. God invented work. God calls us to work. God calls us alongside of him to work. Work is not bad. But what happens in life when, when money becomes our focal point, we will, we, will, we will mortgage our family. I've seen people do this for money. And God says, that is so foolish. Don't do it. You need to, it, it, it is a wise person who knows when it's quitting time. Work isn't everything, money isn't everything. Be wise enough to desist. Proverbs 10, 4 says, a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Not wealthy, but rich. It's okay to work. And work hard. Put your back into it. Especially if you're working for God and not money. When you start seeing what you do and, you know, the boss... If, you, if, if the boss of your work is, is who you're working for, it's, it's also not the same thing. That's, I mean, there's a really good chance you're going to be miserable, especially if you don't like your boss. And this is like, this is like multiply it by two if you're self-employed. Some, you, some of you don't, need, you don't need a new job. You think you need a new job. You, you don't necessarily need a new job. You need a new boss. Work for the Lord. You'll be amazed what will happen. What will happen to your attitude. What will happen to your character. You might even be amazed what will happen to your boss. Proverbs 18.11 says, A rich man's wealth is his strong city. And like a high wall in his imagination. (laughs) I love that one. You know, it's like this this idea that wealth is going to bring us security, right? That's what it's all about. It's about security. We need to have that security, that retirement account is the security. Maybe social security is your security. Are you still telling yourself that these days? Wow. We even call, I mean, that's what we invented. So we call it social security. <laughs> that's, we're not even trying to hide it anymore, right? When we think that, when, 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 we're our, when our answer to the question of who our provider is, if it's me, then that's, what, that's all my money is going to be. Is it's, it's a pretend wall. It's a pretend source of security. And as long as nobody messes with that, we're going to be just fine. And the good news is no one's ever lost their pension except all the time it happens, right? Uh, it's, 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 maybe it's been a few minutes. If money is your source of security... We need to go back to the beginning. Proverbs 11.4 says, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. I was literally in a class where we were teaching about, you know, we're talking about the second coming and talking about um, you know, people were, were trying to answer questions about um, you know, Revelation. It can be kind of, it can feel like a tricky, tricky book. And we're talking about, um, you know, all of these things. We're studying um, some of the things in the Old Testament that were referred to as days of wrath when God brought judgment upon his people or even other nations. And, um, 
And I was amazed at how many people were preparing for, for the judgment of God by storing up things in their house. As if, you know, you remember the show, what was it, the show on TV about preppers? Doomsday preppers? Look, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to make fun of that. I'm not trying to say it's not a good idea to have, you know, I, I think it's a good idea to have a savings account. I think it's a good idea to, um, uh, there have been a, a few things happen. I don't, know if, I don't know if you remember this. There have been a few things happen um, in our history. Um, I don't know, once a lot of people all over the planet got sick, and it made it, made it really hard to get certain supplies. Do you, do you remember that? It was kind of ancient history now. I don't, I don't want to really talk about it um, a lot, but, you know, things happen. Um, as a matter of fact, um, one of the most important principles of life is that unforeseen things happen every day. We call them unforeseen because we didn't see them coming, because we can't see them coming. They happen constantly. Things that are unforeseen. And so... Here's an amazing thing. One of the things that we can do, because we know the unforeseen is coming, that we can see it ahead of time, even though it's unforeseen, you know it's coming. You don't have to be surprised by what you're surprised by, in other words, right? You're, you're trying to hear, <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? It's smart to save up. It's smart to be prepared. But it's really dumb to think that doing that will somehow exempt you from the judgment of God that is promised to come on this world someday. Are you preparing for that more than you're preparing for all the other unforeseen stuff? Because God has declared it. It's not unforeseen. It's a guarantee. Listen, don't, don't work for money. Get paid but work for God. Just that one mindset will, has the power to, to radically transform your, your life. And number three is, I kind of already said this, save. It's a good idea, save. You don't know what's going to happen in the future, but you do know that you're gonna get older. If you, you, know, if you stay alive, I got older this last week, uh, I'm, I'm, I am, I am now in my mid forties, 49. And, um, at the end of the year, it will be my late forties, but for now it's my mid forties. And, um, if, uh, if the Lord should tarry and I should live someday, I'll retire. And it's a good idea to get prepared for that. Um, it's a good idea to be prepared for, um, I don't know, I've, I've been to the emergency room a lot. And one of the best ways to um, discern what will happen in the future is look what has happened in the past and there's a good chance I'll be in the emergency room again. And I should say for that. Um, I have a car and 100% of cars sooner or later break down. 100%, all of them do. Even the ones you really like and you want to keep it in the condition that it's in right now, you're going to have to spend some money. You don't know when the transmission's going to go out, but you do know that it will. I promise you. Uh, my, uh, our, our friend Eric, um, just, it was, it's kind of a funny story. I hope it's okay. I didn't ask him if I could tell you this. Eric, I don't know if you're listening, <laughs> but I'm going to tell this story. Text me if you don't want me to. I didn't get a text. So... Um, <laughs> Or he's not watching. He should have been. <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> he, he just, it was, this, it was this great thing. He bought a car. Had, um, some, some friends are, were helping, and, and he bought a car, found a really great buy in, in, uh, in another state, and uh, Bill actually was driving it back, got to Utah, engine blue. Brand new. I mean, he just bought that car. It wasn't new; it was used, but it was he just he just got it. Still under warranty. That was the good news, right? So they were put they put a new engine in it and and all this stuff. But you know what? It's gonna happen, no matter what. Stuff's gonna wear out. It's a good idea to save. Um, 
it's a good idea to save. Proverbs 13, 11 says this, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but the, whoever, gains, gather, or whoever gathers little by little will increase it. That's smart. Proverbs 22, 26 and 27 says, be not one of those who gives pledges, but who put, who, who put up security for debts. If you have nothing with which to pay, why should your bed be taken from under you? This is God's way of saying, stay out of debt. Don't mortgage your future, especially for things that you don't need. I realize that in our culture, there are some things that you have to take a loan for. There are very few things that you need to take a loan for. Be very, very careful when moving toward debt. And if you're in debt, do whatever it takes to get out. Um, we, we, we offer a, uh, a class here on a pretty regular basis called Financial Peace University. It's a Dave Ramsey class. You probably have heard about it. If you haven't, um, you need to. There is a book out you can read. It's like his money makeover or whatever um, for Financial Peace University. If you haven't read it, if you haven't been in the class and you have debt, my friend, Get yourself that book. Get into that class. Do this for yourself. You won't be sorry. It will be, um, it will be life in breathing back into you. Um, it, is a, uh, it will be a huge blessing and a huge benefit. Be very careful when it comes to this. Don't mortgage your future or prepare for it. Bottom line is this. Listen, pursue godly money management principles. Pursue wise and godly money management principles. Just learn. Don't ever stop learning about, uh, about these things and, and get better at it. Add, this, as wi add wisdom to your life in this area. Over the years, I've, I've heard so many people um, talk about it. Like I mentioned before, you know, God, all God wants is your money. And it, honestly, at the end of the day, the answer I have for that is, you wish, you wish all that God wanted from you was your money. Number one, God wants everything, okay? Let's, let's not, uh, let's, he doesn't just want your, he, he doesn't even just want 10% of your money. He wants 100% of everything that you have, everywhere you have it, whenever you have it. That's what he really wants. But on the, uh, at the same time, I, I wish, there have been so many times I would be like, God, I wish you would just take my money. You would do so much better with it than I do. I'm an idiot. I keep, I keep blowing up my life with this. You take it. And it's not just money. It's like uh, there's so many times I've gone to God and just be like, won't you just take this over? And his answer is no. If you go to God and you say, God, I want you to do it. You be my friend. He's going to say no. Because if he did that, you know what would happen to you? Nothing. You wouldn't grow. You wouldn't learn. It wouldn't stretch your faith. It wouldn't cause you to become something better. It wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, benefit your character. It's just not what God has offered any of us. He hasn't offered to take over. He hasn't offered uh, to, to bail us out. What he has offered is to give us wisdom, to learn, to grow and develop and experience transformation. You don't have to grow. Listen, I, I want to say this. You don't have to grow in wisdom in any area of your life, including becoming um, Money-wise, you, you don't have to, but you can. You can. He's offered it. And before we even asked, he's already said, if you ask, I will say yes. There's no risk. He'll do it. You can experience all the blessing that wise financial management brings into, into our lives, but you can't expect God to do it for you. He's not going to do that. He doesn't, he doesn't want your money. <laughs> He's got plenty. What he does want is for you to become wise, for you to experience freedom, 
for you to rise above materialism and to experience the abundant life of Jesus that only a life that's centered on him can. That's what he wants. Paul wrote the book of Galatians, and in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Paul is talking about a very specific type of slavery in this passage. He's talking about you know, this religious religious slavery that the Judaizers are calling the, these new Christians into, and, and it is, it's, um, it, it's not what, uh, it's obviously not what God wants for us in this life to be a slave of any type. We enjoy the idea that America is the land of the free, and yes, to a great extent, we enjoy a good measure of political freedom. We really do. Better than, I mean, more than anyone else you know, on this planet. Yeah, what I have found is that there are so many ways that we are not free. So many. Addiction enslaves us. We are enslaved by sometimes our own expectations, by fear, by shame, by debt, by grief. And the list just goes on and on. I wonder if we haven't just become so accustomed to things, to all the things that enslave us that we struggle to imagine what true freedom really is. Friends, true freedom is found only in Jesus. Some of you know this. Some of you have experienced this. It's the only place. In whatever area of your life that you want to experience freedom, just come in that area. If you will come to a place of full surrender to Jesus, you will experience freedom. Take whatever it is. And give it to Jesus. That's how it works. That's where freedom comes from. Which is why God comes to us and offers this type of financial freedom. And he says, all you have to do is learn to be generous with a God who made it all, who doesn't need any of it, and can supply all your needs according to his glorious riches, and you will find freedom. Here's the principle. The principle is this. If you want to find freedom from, fill in the blank, you must first surrender to. In America, we need to learn this so bad. Every time I pick up a Every time I, well, I don't ever pick up a paper. Every time I open an email with news in it about our country's finances, it's always trillions. I don't even know what that is anymore. We are so addicted to this. We are so enslaved to this, to this idol of materialism in our culture. There may, be, there may be nothing we need more than to find freedom in this area. And it doesn't start in Washington, D.C. It starts in Delta, Colorado. It starts with us. To be free. If you want to be free from, you first must surrender to. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the freedom that we can find in you. And yet it, it, it strikes us as though... Um, well, we realize that in order to be free from these things that, um, that fill our lives with grief and fear and anxiety that are just uh, chain us to the destiny of this world, to be free from that, we must, we must come to you and surrender to you. that we must put you first in all of these areas and, 
and you alone have the power to, to free us, to, to cause the shackles that we find ourselves in to just fall at the ground around us. But yet, um, we struggle to do that because of, <laughs> because of the fears and the anxieties and the, the desires of our flesh, all of the things. It's kind of the, it's, it's, it's the slavery that we know. And so, Father, we turn to you and we just ask you today, God, would you somehow teach our hearts to be free? Would you somehow fill us with the kind of courage that we need to stand up and, and just dash these idols to pieces. That in Christ we could stand as a shining example to a world that so desperately needs freedom. This is what it looks like. This is what it means to be free. Jesus, we ask you to do that in our lives. We ask you to, uh, to teach us this way. Give us this wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray.